Glory to Jesus Christ. So we're reading the Epistle to the Romans, St. Paul's Epistle to the Romans. Many would say the, the central epistle of, his, of all St. Paul's writings and theology. And we're on chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. And I'm using the Revised Standard Version Catholic, uh, in particular the uh, second edition, the second Catholic edition, Ignatius Press San Francisco, using the, the New Testament text. Now they have both with the study Bible. Uh, now that's just been put out by Ignatius Press and it was published in 2010, 2010. And it's, if you have the same, it's uh, on page 263, 263. So let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Blessed Lord, who have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may wisely hear them, read them, mark them, learn them, and inwardly digest them, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast <coughs> to the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the heart of your faithful and enkindle them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O heavenly King, comfort a spirit of truth who are everywhere present and filling all things. O treasure your blessings and giver of life. Come dwell within us and cleanse our souls. O gracious Lord, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. <coughs> I may be wheezing and coughing and making animal noises. And so it's this uh, post-nasal drip thingy, but I don't know. Therefore, this is, as I said, page 263, if you want to, but this is uh, chapter 5 of Romans, the verses 1 through 12. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in our hope of sharing the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. While we were yet helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Why? One would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we are now justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. M much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Not only so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received our reconciliation. So, so we're justified by faith. But note that he doesn't say, a faith in isolation or belief. All you need to do is believe. No, it's, it's it, pistis as living faith. Pistis is faith in Greek. Uh, but uh, it's living, living faith. A dead faith gets us nowhere. Although, as, as I said, Father Conley told us at the seminary, Better have dead faith than no faith at all because dead faith can be revived. It can be filled with grace. If you believe something, then you can come to 
authentic conviction in which you apply this, you live this. Because faith is united with hope and love. And in 1 Corinthians, he t St. Paul in Corinthians 13, talks about that, that unity and the superiority of, of love over every, every other thing. Agape love, that is, of course. So, since we're justified by faith, so we're made righteous. We share the righteousness of God. God is sharing his very righteousness. His dikaiosune, that's the Greek word for that. And, uh, and his, his dike, his justice. Uh, by transforming us. Uh, not by our transforming ourselves. It's not like I, I, I'm a rugged individual and I will obtain all this virtue on myself just by hard work, by strength of will. It's not going to work. We, we have to rely on the grace of God in this. We have to cooperate. Uh, we can't be uh, passive in that way. It will just happen. Uh, I, I don't need to be invested in Christ. I can just, you know, my beliefs and stuff like that, or I can, or, uh, you know, I can go through uh, the sacraments and receive them once. You know, you get baptized, of course, you can only be baptized once. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And confirmation, let's say, again, only once in, in Catholicism, I blow in Eastern Orthodox, I believe, if you, if you radically lapse or some forms of it, uh, let's say you apostatized or something for, to another religion or whatever, that you would be chrismated again. I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that. But, um, but we're justified by this living faith, made uh, righteous, not just coated over with some sort of something, not some, sh uh, uh, you know, the ice cream cones that I loved as a child that, I still love them. The the soft serve ice cream cones that had the chocolate dip and you'd dip that in it and then you'd have this this shell of ice cream and if it were of of chocolate, milk chocolate. Uh and if it were hot, you really had to go at it. I used to remember licking the bottom as it started to melt, you know, gradually, so I could really appreciate it. Uh, but grace isn't just like that. It's not some shell some uh, whatever, and then you're something underneath. Well, it wouldn't be bad if it were ice cream underneath, but uh, we need to be, tra we're transformed by grace and, we ha and that we have to cooperate with this because uh, God, uh, as St. Augustine said, uh, God who created us without our consent will not f save us without our consent. So we need to cooperate. We need to uh, live this. And this shouldn't produce uh, worry in us, you know, am I good enough? Of course you're not good enough. God, however, is infinitely good. And he's giving us his grace to cooperate with him, to cooperate with him, and to grow in grace, grow in, in the sharing of the very divine nature, uh, uh, that we're partakers of the divine nature, as, as Second Peter in the first chapter tells us. So we're justified by faith. And because of this, this living faith, which is, again, connected with all the virtues, culminating in love, and authentic faith is per, uh, permeated with love and draws us to love, uh, <coughs> this agape love, and it draws us to, uh, uh, ultimately, total devotion to God. And so uh, we shouldn't wait for any ultimate. We should be striving to do this now in the power of grace, accepting this gift, the gift of, of, of God's sharing his very life with us. So we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, because we who were alienated by grave sin and uh, uh, in Christ, we are reconciled with the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit because he bore all this for us. And in uh, our faith, the faith tells us, the living faith tells us that and animates us to live that, live that faith. So we, and we have peace, the shalom, which isn't just a cessation of conflict, it's har a harmony as well. Irene in Greek, uh, the name Irene means peace. 
So if you're ever in jeopardy and they ask that. Uh, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, not through my storming heaven somehow or other, but through our Lord Jesus Christ and, uh, and uh, cooperating with his merits, his infinite merits that he won for us through his incarnation, his, the eternal word, God, the eternal word, becoming fully one of us, culminating, I'll reuse that word, in his saving death, the all-sufficient sacrifice, and his resurrection. <coughs> Those two go together, the death and resurrection. And so we are to live in that. We're baptized into his saving death and resurrection. We're immersed in his grace. But we have to grow in it. We have, and again, God's not going to force us. There's no irresistible grace. He's not going to force us. But he's pouring out his life, his love for us, that we can, we can have this. We can live as the very children of God. We can be grow and grow more transformed. No matter how messed up we are, Christ's grace is <coughs> infinitely stronger. And uh, you're not going to, you know, it's not like the, the fairy godmother touching you when you, you're a pumpkin and you turn into a carriage or something. No, that's not the way it is. It's, it's a struggle. It's a process. It's a pilgrimage in this life. Although some people, it does seem that, poof, they have uh, something, but that's exceedingly rare. And then they also have to struggle because the devil, the more you grow in grace, the more the devil attacks. So uh, the devil uh, wants his minions to be uh, uh, sedated, shall we say, by getting more or less what they want, or at least yearning. He, he holds these things out, the, the uh, saying, oh, your lusts will be fulfilled and all this stuff. But that, that doesn't happen, does it? They're... How happy are these people consumed by this? So it's, it's Christ who gives us this, this authentic happiness, even in the midst of sorrow, as he's going to say in the, this, that the, the reality of our union with Christ suffering. And this, so he said, uh, through him we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. So Christ is the way, the truth, and life. There is no other way. There's no other way to, to the reality of heaven. There's no other way to the... the, 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 the. Now, does this mean that people who don't know about him, who, who honestly don't, or whatever, uh, no, that's... No, God is just. God is good. Uh, but this, uh, and if that's the case, does that mean that we don't have to evangelize? We don't have to spread the faith? So, Oh, no. It's even more important for us to spread the faith, especially now, and especially when people get caught up in uh, self-destructive behaviors and uh, socially destructive behaviors and, and uh, live in mortal sin in the, in the kingdom of Satan. Known willed mortal sin, that is. Uh, with uh, uh, violating their consciences uh, or uh, deadening their consciences, more likely. So, um, so we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. So and it's by grace that we have, it's grace that's the access to the grace, the, gra the, the sanctifying grace. And uh, the cross is the key to all this, the key opening these doors uh, and, and the reality of repentance. Uh, without repentance, faith isn't alive. Now, uh, I'm talking about repentance from known, willed, grave sin. But repentance is a part of the work of faith, uh, which is uh, flows from the gift of faith and uh, the connection with authentic faith with uh, uh, all the virtues, in particular love. Faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love, as St. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13. <clears throat> so, and we, in this grace in which we stand. So I often, the, the, the image I have is the, of, you know, I, I'm in this 
you know, in this pool of of God's great energy, of God, and then you know, it's, I'm standing in it, you know, up to my up to my neck, and it's all flowing all over. And uh, but uh, standing means being firm in this, being firm in in the in the commitment to grace, which again is a gift of grace, when when we have to cooperate with. So, and we rejoice in our hope of sharing the glory of God. So joy, the reality of, of Christian joy, the Holy Spirit joy, is, is something that's not dependent on outer circumstances. So it's not dependent on my health, my physical health. It's not dependent on, on my mental health. But it's not dependent on, you know, if I'm prospering materially or anything like that. This uh, the joy is from within, and it's from the living faith, which is the reality of coming forth. Reality of grace, so it's uh, God, my joy. So and uh, it it be joy even in the midst of tears, even in the midst of our sorrows and sufferings. So we rejoice in our hope of sharing the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings. Now that is totally counterintuitive. But the, this is the persevering joy, even, even when we're suffering. And, the more, and uh, the more we suffer for Christ, the more we, we know that joy. Because we know this, is, is, this world isn't all there is. And that evil will not be victorious. That uh, aggressive violence will not be victorious. That uh, the crushing of the attempt to crush the gospel altogether will not be victorious. And so that's why so many of the martyrs were uh, rejoicing, rejo rejoicing uh, 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 visibly at their martyrdom, which is why uh, many of the pagan Romans, uh, you know, an example is you know, the martyrdom of St. Blandina in Lyon, uh, they said, well, this, it must be witchcraft that they're, if they're all happy about this, this is just, uh, or, or or even courageous, you know, not screaming or whatever like that, although I'm sure a lot of them would, I think I would be screaming, but I would be screaming, praise Jesus Christ, um, and forgiving, which is also a crucial uh, application of faith. <laughs> that we know by faith, we have the this knowledge of faith that uh, we can forgive, that we are forgiven and that we can channel that forgiveness to others. So we rejoice in the hope of sharing the glory of God. We rejoice in our sufferings. So that's the great test of authentic faith in many ways, or of mature faith, I should say, uh, that we can rejoice even in the midst of our sufferings, when we're suffering for Christ. And even to uh, think of uh, saints like, uh, uh, now I can't think of her name, of Shedom, Lidwina, Lidwina of Shedom, uh, who suffered terribly. She had a skating, this I think is the 14th century, um, she had a skating accident in the Netherlands of uh, the Low Countries and uh, ice skating, I think, and she never recovered from it. She got all sorts of infections and all sorts of things. And, uh, you know, and doctors, you know, came to her, but the, the knowledge of in the, that period was li very limited, but she knew joy. She knew joy and all this stuff, and she said uh, uh, she wouldn't give it up because of the union. The uh, she was experiencing this union with Christ on the cross and and uh, various other things. And thank God she had a very supportive family who uh, helped her through. She had, you know she lived uh, throughout in her life with this. Uh, but we rejoice in our sufferings. No, we don't provoke sufferings. You know there are people. People go uh, and self-torture 
out and they think God wants that. God doesn't want self-torture. God wants self-discipline. <coughs> and he uh, wants us to know the, the happiness of salvation even in the midst of our struggles and sorrows and in the uh, frustrations of this mortal life. We rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance. So, uh, you know, we're tested in this, this struggle and the suffering, whether mental suffering, spiritual suffering, even physical sufferings, <coughs> that <coughs> God is all in all and that we're united with Christ and uh, the crown, more jewels in the crown, uh, the celestial crown, when we turn to, to Christ and all this, we turn everything over, united with him. Which is why I find the crucifix, not just the cross, the crucifix with Christ uh, depicted dead or dying on the cross as the great sign of love. That God, that's the proof of God, that God is love. That he went through this whole thing, even death, all, all sorts of suffering. And so the suffering, when we, uh, when we persevere in that brings endurance. So we can go through that because uh, the, te the devil wants us always to give up. If he can't uh, suck us into grave sin, he wants us to be uh, inactive spiritually. And uh, it wants us to be discouraged and, and not to persevere in, in uh, seeking God's will or in service, authentic service to other people. So knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character. So that, so with, uh, as we endure in applying faith in living hope and in living the, the reality of love, that our character is formed more and more. <coughs> Sometimes it needs to be reformed. In, in the power of grace, in the power of lived faith, in the power of authentic love. And so, and this hope carries us through here. And the character, good character, uh, produces hope. And you'd think, well, wouldn't it be the other way around, that hope produces character? Well, that's true too, but it's, as we live this out, our hope becomes stronger. Uh, and as those who don't live it out, their hope becomes weaker. Character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Because what's the goal of our hope? Not anything in this world, uh, materially. It's what's within. Then the kingdom of God is within us. The kingdom of God is around us. And the kingdom of God is beyond us. So we see that finish line in the uh, reality of God's goodness. Even though things may not be going, we are, that, <clears throat> you know, our prayers are various that don't seem to be answered, but they are in Christ because the goal is not even in this world. Yes, we have to apply this in the world and we have to be of service in this world. <coughs> but this world is passing away and everything is. You know, everything's in flux. Uh, so, uh, but God is the one, the eternal, the infinite, all good. And so we, we trust him in this. So this uh, trusting faith, this Fiducia, that's a nice name. It sounds like a pasta dish, but uh, that's the, the state of, of fidelity, of, of uh, trusting, trusting God and putting it into effect. So you could say fides is fidelity and fiducia is what leads into it. But um, so, so we have that the sufferings produce endurance. 
The endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not put disappoint us. Why? Because God's love has been poured into our hearts. He doesn't say, oh, well, you know, we have our, you know, our, our beliefs are firm, which is good. But it's God's love that's poured into us. The, the reality of, of uh, the reality of grace, the, the God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Because remember the Trinity, there's no separate action for the persons of the Trinity. They're one being and they're uh, one, one purpose and everything, one in purpose, uh, as well as one in being, you know, uh, substance, essence, and uh, one in nature, divine nature. So they, uh, they all act, always act as one. As distinct persons that they are. So God's love has been poured into our, not just dusted onto our hearts, not just you know, sprinkled over, but poured, poured into our hearts. And heart here isn't just feeling, heart is the center of the self. Through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So <clears throat> to pervade, to act in us, to, to, to and again, of course, with the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> Jesus Christ to God and to man, and the Father also. <clears throat> Living tabernacles of the Trinity, as uh, St. Elizabeth of Trinity uh, said. So, verse six, while we were yet helpless, so this isn't you know, uh, uh, demanding uh, payment for services, while we were yet helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. So why didn't he, you know, in the initial, after the initial revolt of the first people, <clears throat> why didn't he come right then? Why wasn't, you know, uh, able God incarnate? Why not? I don't know. But it's God's time. God's time. And what Colorado called the scandal of particularity. Why then? Why, why not now when he could have, you know, been on at his own YouTube channel and everything. He could have been on the news constantly <coughs> all over the world. No, it was at that time, that was the fullness of time, 2,000 years ago. And in that place, in that family. So while we were yet helpless, I guess, you know, with, uh, without divine power that, we're helpless. <coughs> we can't pull ourselves up. I'm fallen. I I've fallen, and I can't get up. At the right time, Christ died. Just for the godly, just for some remote group of elect, some t tiny elite. No, he died for everybody. He died for the ungodly. He didn't just die for people who were. Uh, you know, doing well spiritually. He died for everybody in his humanity. Huma that humanity united in uh, with the divine person in, in one person, in Jesus Christ. Why, one would hardly die for a righteous man, although perhaps for a good man, one would dare even to die. Like, you know, you'd die for your children, you'd die for that. But, uh, but for people who hated you, people who want to kill you, you know, I'm sure Jesus wasn't overflowing with nice, fuzzy feelings for those who were torturing him. And if, but he was overflowing with love for them, for those who were torturing and killing him and mocking him. So, but God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's not, well, uh, you pull yourself up to my standards and fulfill them. Then I'll, I'll be there for you. No, he's there for us through the whole thing. And God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
this, this crazy love by the standards of the world. Since, therefore, we are now justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? That, again, the image, the image of the king, uh, the just king, uh, enraged by, by sin and disrespect and all that stuff. Uh, but, of course, God is totally constant in his, his virtue and all this stuff. He doesn't lose it. Stuff like that. He doesn't uh, lose, get to the end of whatever. But he, um, but he is just. This is the wrath of God is the rejection of his justice. The wrath of God is the rejection of his mercy. The wrath of God is the rejection of his love. That's uh, how we see. That's uh, the analogy that's used. Analogy to human. Because Jesus Christ is fully human and knew the whole range of our emotions. Now, of course, in the resurrected state, he only has positive emotions. Um, but uh, in his human, human body and human nature. Well, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Again, not just for some elite. He died for everybody. Since, therefore, and, and if people don't accept it, it's their own, as far, again, Father Conley said, your own damn fault, literally damned. So, uh, but let God do the judging of that. Uh, let, and, uh, let us assess everything in the, uh, by the standards of, of Christ, by the, the law of God, by the uh, strength of grace, but uh, it's, it's God who passes judgment. St. Paul said, I don't even pass judgment on myself. We assess ourselves. And I'm the only person who can really assess myself. You're the only person who can really assess you. So, uh, and, uh, but a lot of people don't want to go there. Some of it's spiritual laziness, and a lot of it is pride. So, um, <coughs> so. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled by God through the death of his God, how much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? So the death, but the life of Christ is selfific. And uh, we're not even more now that we're friends and, and, and uh, seeking this, how much more will we be transformed? So, not only so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ, God incarnate, through whom we have now received our reconciliation. Brought, uh, having peace made for us and, and a, a friendship restored with God. And in that friendship and peace can be restored to others. So, and the, the footnotes here, which I believe are mostly... Uh, Dr. Hahn and uh, Curtis Mitch, but there are others too, and I don't know who they are. So, um, chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. The justified are endowed with theological virtues, the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. By faith... They live in peace with God and have access to his grace. In hope, they long for the glory of God that awaits them. And through love, they show that the charity of the Spirit dwells in their hearts. See the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1813. That's the number, not the year. <coughs> Equipped in this way, believers can become more like Christ, to endurance and suffering. So it's not, you know, if people say to you, oh, accept Christ and everything, you'll have no problems. Everything will be just sweetness. Uh, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, no, uh, take up your cross and follow me, Jesus said in this life. The sweetness, God grant that we get a lot of it, the consolation, but... Uh, that's the frosting. It's not the cake. 
the cake is the love. So, uh, and the more we love, the more, more we have more empathy and more we have compassion, the more we suffer with, literally, compassion, suffering with. <coughs> Equipped in this way, believers can become more Christ-like through endurance and suffering. Through the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 618. And see 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Where we were talking about that. Uh, the, so, uh, verse 8. God shows his love. The dying of Christ shows us the depth of God's unconditional love for the world. So it's, it's unconditional. His, his love is universal. His love is infinite. Uh, <coughs> uh, but our willingness to yield to that love, that's another story. Unconditional love for the world, whole cosmos. But of course, they also talk about the world of, of, of those who reject this. Uh, uh, the uh, the corporate rebellion, but uh, that's not what it, it means here. Paul Cosmos, the, <coughs> it means the universe. It means <coughs> everybody is called to this, and indeed the ultimate the reconciliation and healing of of the of the whole <coughs> whole earth, the whole everything in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. At the parousia, at his second coming, the resurrection, the bodily resurrection. So, First John three sixteen, this is all the more remarkable since the world being ungodly. Uh, verse six and enemies. Verse ten. Did not deserve it. So we would say, I'm unworthy at all. Day. Yeah, we're unworthy. Yeah, we don't deserve God's love. We don't deserve unity with the infinite and the eternal. But that's God's very nature to uh, reach out to us, to love us, and, uh, for, and for us to cooperate with that. Verse 10, we shall be saved. Salvation can be described in terms of the past. I've been saved. I'm saved. I'm being saved. And I will be saved. Again, uh, with grace and my cooperation with grace. Uh, drawn from grace. And drawn toward grace. Salvation can be described in terms of the past, the present, and the future. The, the total salvation in, in the in, in the reality of heaven. It is passed with reference to baptism, which saves us from the filth of our sins. See First Peter three twenty one. And the, the reality of baptism now saves you. <coughs> it is a present reality when we allow grace to make us steadily more virtuous and holy. First Corinthians one eighteen. It is a future hope that we will forever live with the Lord in glory, Hebrews 9, 28. See the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1, 6, 9, and 10, 26. So, let's look at... Let's look at uh, Father Barnabas M. Ahern, a passionist, from the New Testament Reading Guide, the Collegeville New Testament Reading Guide, published by the Liturgical Press, Collegeville, Minnesota, in 1960. From the uh, New Testament Reading Guide, the Epistles to the Galatians and to the Romans. <coughs> Excuse me. 
and this is page 52, page 52, the riches and requirements of salvation, the results of justification. Romans 5, verses 1 to 11. There is no make-believe in the justice that fills the believer and shines forth in his whole person. Previously a sinner, he now lives in peace with God because of all that Christ is and has accomplished. For he who believes that Christ, our brother, died and rose again to abide... <laughs> excuse me... <coughs> to abide forever with his loving father, knows for certain that he himself, because of Christ, enjoys God's favor. And so he exalts confidently in the hope of one day sharing the glory of the father. Consequently, though it may sound paradoxical, well, paradox, it's all about all paradox, but it's not in contradiction. This is the logic of love here. Consequently, though it may sound paradoxical, he finds even in tribulation a source of security. This is St. Paul. For if he continues to trust in God, even in the midst of suffering, he develops that constancy, which is the very fiber of virtue. So I don't have you know, virtue. There's, if it's a one-shot thing. You know, if I'm good to somebody once, it's not the virtue of generosity. It's a habit, the habit of it, the, the fiber of virtue. That constancy, which is the very fiber of virtue, it is persevering faith in God that keeps man alive to God's gifts. I'm going to repeat that. It is persevering faith in God that keeps man alive to God's gifts. And it's all gift. This temper of soul is bound to strengthen hope. The more constant is one's faith in God, the more certain is his hope of sharing in God's glory. Again, this union, faith, hope, and love. And the, this perseverance, this endurance, this constancy, this growth in character. But... Someone might see here merely a subjective state of mind, a beautiful dream induced by wishful thinking. Paul anticipates the objection and denies forthrightly that Christian hope can prove illusory. As proof, he points to the gift of the Holy Spirit, whom God bestows on every Christian in baptism. His dynamic and beneficent activity in the life of the believer, constantly manifests God's merciful love and provides a sure pledge of greater mercies if only he who believes perseveres in faith until the end. There is yet another objective reason to bolster Christian confidence. This is page 53. God chose the very time when men were too weak to help themselves as the moment when Christ would die for sinners. There is something extraordinary in this. It is rare to find anyone ready to give his life for another. And we, you know, we celebrate that in uh, Memorial Day and Veterans Day and other days about that. Even for a good man, though in the case of, of a really deserving man, someone may be willing to sacrifice himself. This fact of experience focuses clear light on the incomparable reality of God's merciful love. For it was precisely when mankind was in a sinful condition that Christ died for us. Paul draws a conclusion with compelling logic. If Christ died that sinners might live an entirely new life as just men in the eyes of God, how reasonable it is that he should save though these just men from condemnation at the final judgment. For if God intervened to help men when they were actually hostile to him, how much more should he intervene to save them now that they have become his friends? Moreover, if God's first intervention caused the death of his own son, God the Father, God the Son, Holy Spirit are all participating in this, how much more readily Will he intervene to save the just at the final judgment? 
those who are justified, those who are uh, touched with his righteousness and indeed pervaded by his righteousness. If you, those who are pervaded with his righteousness are not only citizens of heaven, they enter into heaven. <coughs> they don't have to <coughs> dwell on the porch uh, to be cleansed because they're, they're totally cleansed, uh, totally converted. The saints. He will save the just at the final judgment when he need merely confirm their actual sharing in the life of the risen Christ. Hence, our reconciliation to God through the death of Christ <coughs> definitively opened the way to final salvation so that now we are able to enjoy full confidence in God because of our Lord Jesus Christ to whom we owe our reconciliation. And now, uh, Scott Hahn and Curtis Mitch from and my favorite mosaic of Christ the Chefalu, the Christ of Chefalu. Um, this is the Catholic Commentary on Sacred Scripture, the volume on Romans, by Scott W. Hahn and Curtis Mitch, published by Baker Academic, a division of Baker Publishing, Grand Rapids, Michigan, in 2017. <coughs> and this is on page 73. Peace with God through Christ. How do we know that Romans 5 to 8 is an identical unit, identifiable unit in the epistle? The opening verses of chapter 5 and the closing verses of chapter 8, Paul repeats key terms, themes, and ideas. Paul begins and ends the section with attention to God's love, the tribulations of this life, the need for endurance through suffering, and the hope of future glory. <coughs> Using the word therefore, Paul <coughs> excuse me, signals his intent to draw out the implications of his teaching. In chapters 1 through 4, having already described the basis of justification, he moves on to consider the benefits of justification. Everything that follows in chapters 5 to 8 can be traced back to the conviction that we, Paul and his Christian readers and us now, have been justified by faith. On the one hand, our initial justification is viewed as a past event. On the other hand, it is a fact that gives rise to other facts that call for closer attention. I am saved, I am being saved, I will be saved. The first is that we have peace with God. Which means having a proper relationship between the father and the human family restored. So just think of an analogy of a family in which there's been alienation, you know, from the father and uh, and the children, and uh, so this 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 reconciliation. This uh, just think of the parable of the prodigal son, in many ways. <coughs> Excuse me. So, by through Christ, we have peace with God, the Father. It certainly includes an absence of hostilities. Peace. Again, with the shalom is more than that. It's the harmony. And it has a positive dimension as well. Paul probably has in mind the Hebrew notion of shalom, which indicates a state of covenant, communion, and well-being. Peace of this sort may come with a sense of inner tranquility, but its essence is relational more than experiential. So it's not just I feel at peace, but I'm, I'm at peace, I'm in harmony. And this isn't a, a, a passing thing, this is a rooted thing. It comes through the Messiah and the mediator of the new covenant, our Lord Jesus Christ. See John fourteen twenty seven. 
Another result of justification is that Christians have gained access by faith, the living faith, to this grace in which we stand. Christ's actions in history have made it possible for believers to enter the sphere of God's presence and mercy. This sounds rather abstract, but Paul's thoughts may well be more concrete. The term access, Greek, prosagoge, may, can suggest, this is now page 74, may suggest admittance into the presence of a king as well as entrance into a temple. See Ephesians 2.18. Access to both the throne and the temple were restricted to an authorized few. <coughs> For Paul, these associations are not alternative ways of conceptualizing our, pro- our approach to God, but more like two sides of the same coin. In the Old Testament, the Lord is the divine king whose invisible presence was believed to sit enthroned not in a war tent or a royal audience hall, but on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Second Samuel 6, 2, Isaiah 37, 16. In the innermost chamber of the temple in Jerusalem, 1 Kings 6, 19. Paul may well envision our access to grace as a spiritual admittance into the sanctuary of heaven. So... So uh, the tearing of the temple veil at Jesus' crucifixion is this reconciliation, (coughs) this thing in in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So the only thing we can boast in is is the grace of God. Anything else is is arrogance and folly. A schoolyard... uh, boasted. The justified believers boast or exult, which is a better word, I think, in the hope of attaining the glory of God. The heavy immortality, everything that awaits all this, this unity, the resurrection, (coughs) the total unity and and sanctification and (coughs) elevation of body, soul, and spirit. Believers, wait, this is in the middle of page, whatever this is, 74. Believers wait for this glory and joyful hope because it is not something they already see with their eyes and hold in their grasp. See Romans 8, 24 to 25. Christian hope is neither a vague optimism nor a presumptuous assurance about the outcome of God's final judgment. So we have the blessed assurance, but we don't have the arrogance of uh, presumption, which can be spiritually fatal. So, rather it is the confident expectation of receiving what God has prepared for those who love him, provided they conform themselves to Christ and so confirm their status as God's children and heirs. So, then he goes from this to the afflictions that he said, yet we even boast of our afflictions. We uh, exalt in our afflictions. Uh, So we have the joy even in the midst of affliction because it's united to Christ. Paul has not misspoken. This is toward the bottom of the page, 74. (coughs) Ah, Excuse me. (coughs) Paul has not misspoken. He attaches tremendous significance to suffering, as is evident in his missionary preaching. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God, Acts 14.22. For the apostle, suffering is integral to God's redemptive purposes. Take up your cross and follow me. It is part of the Christian path. Don't I say path and not just path, because I'm from Boston. It is the part of the Christian path because it sculpts us into the image of Jesus. I like that that image, that word picture, being sculpted, the Father sculpting us into the image of Jesus. 
and they would say, oh, the very image of my son. Who passed into glory by way of the cross. Paul will say more about the saving persons of suffering in Romans 8. He outlines a process of Christian growth now and maturation in four steps. Why is it affliction an occasion for boasting, an occasion for exalting? Because it produces endurance, meaning a steadfast will to do what is right and to hold fast to the faith in the midst of adversity. And perseverance, in turn, generates proven character of one who has been tested and found faithful. Finally, having emerged from the fires of tribulation, our hope for heavenly glory is made more firm. So it's, instead of being overwhelmed by discouragement, they, we look even more uh, beyond the veil, about, about through the eyes of faith. How, how this faith pulls us through so much. So, and perseverance, in turn, generates proven character of one who has been tested and found faithful. Finally, having emerged from the fires of tribulation, our hope for heavenly glory is made more firm. Of course, none of this would be possible on the paltry strength of fallen human nature, let alone our own pride. It is owing to the grace in which we stand, verse 2, that virtues such as these are able to blossom and grow in our lives. So, and without that humility, uh, uh, these virtues can corrupt and, and become actually vices. So, uh, there it is. But hope does not disappoint it does not put to shame. Clearly, he wants to encourage readers in their struggles and to assure them that hope refined by affliction will not lead to disillusionment or humiliation in the end, <clears throat> even though we'll have 20, plenty of those in the eyes of the world. But uh, we keep our eyes on the prize, on the reality of heaven. Although he does not quote a specific passage, Paul derives this conviction from Scripture. For example, To you, my God, they cried out and were saved. On you they placed their hope and were not put to shame. Psalm 22, 6 in the Septuagint, the LXX, the, the Alexandrian Greek uh, canon and translation from the Hebrew and Aramaic. Hope has this confidence because the hearts of believers have been filled with the love of God. There is some debate here about what, whether this means God's love for us or our love for God. Well, uh, our love for God can only be because of God's love for us. Paul wants to strengthen believers with the certainty that God loves them. This is all the more crucial in times of anguish and woe when it can feed us as though God is dist when it can feel as though God is distant and unconcerned with our plight. Uh, St. Augustine sees our love for God in this passage there. The new capacity to love God is produced and believers by the Holy Spirit. See Galatians five twenty two and Colossians one eight. In fact, Romans 5, 1 through 5, seems to reference the triad of signature Christian virtues. Faith, verse 1, hope, verse 2 and 4, and love, verse 5. All of which are produced in believers by the Lord's grace. Again, 1 Corinthians thirteen thirteen and 1 Thessalonians 1, 3. It is doubtful that Paul would single out faith, hope, and love in the short compass of five verses without any intended reference to these mainstays of gospel living. The Spirit has been given to dwell in our hearts, of the, the hearts of the justified, is thus the first installment towards the fullness of God's eternal blessing. See 2 Corinthians one twenty two. So, uh, reconciliation with God through Christ. Uh, 
chapter 5, verses 6 to 11. In verses 6 to 11, we look back in time to Christ's death as the basis of our salvation. And then forward in time <coughs> to Christ completing his work of salvation within us. In discussing these matters, Paul invites us to consider the logic of God's actions. If the father has gone to all the trouble of surrendering his son for the benefit of his enemies, how can we doubt his desire to save those who are now his friends? The strong affirmations in this passage are meant to dispel whatever uncertainties about God's love or saving intentions may be lingering in the minds of readers. Paul begins by thinking back to the spiritual condition of our race at the appointed time, at the moment in history when the Messiah went to his death in fulfillment of God's plan. This was a time when humanity was both helpless and ungodly. The first term indicates that we were weak or infirm with respect to salvation, powerless to extricate ourselves from sin and separation from God, a pitiful condition indeed, but a sinister one as well. So Paul adds the second term to indicate that we were habituated to godless ways. The world lived in a more or less continual state of opposition to God. So we were not only sickly, but also stubbornly sinful. And yet Christ laid down his life for sal the salvation of these very people. Paul regards the severity of our predicament as a measure of God's extravagant love. This is on the bottom of page 20, 77. Experience knows that only with difficulty do, does one die for a just person, though perhaps for a good person one might even have courage to die. Everyone has an instinct to live, and so people find it hard to forfeit their lives even for a noble cause. Consent to death requires, this is now page 78, death, consent to death requires a valiant act of the will that is calculated in part by the worthiness of the beneficiary. But Christ shows the uh, boundlessness of his love by pouring out himself for the ungrateful, the, uh, those who are stuck in sin, uh, and offering them a way out, the way of salvation. This makes it all the more remarkable that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The rebellious human race was not worthy of such a sacrifice. Quite the contrary. It was unworthy in every way imaginable, not only devoid of merits, but loaded down with sins and demerits. Uh, and it, not to mention spiritual dementia of, of, uh, of this. The heroic generosity of Jesus thus proves the intensity of God's love for us. Paul is talking about the species of love known in Greek as agape, uh, <coughs> which is neither a mutual affection between friends, that's philia, or uh, which can be, you know, even to death. You know, think of uh, Damon, uh, Damon Pythias, or is it Damon Pythias? But... Um, nor a romantic, romantic passion between lovers, eros, which is in Christian eros, it's, it's marriage, it's dedication. Um, it is the kind of love that wills what is best for another, no matter the cost, <coughs> and no matter how worthy or unworthy they are. <coughs> it is an unconditional love that pours itself out in acts of service and sacrifice. The New Testament describes this love originating with God and enacted in giving. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, John 3.16. In saying this, Paul sheds light on another dimension of the cross. Earlier, he called the Messiah's death proof of God's righteousness. In Romans 3.24.26, now he adds that the Messiah's death is proof of God's love here in chapter 5, verse 8. Both are made visible in Christ's sacrifice. So, uh, uh, how much more will he love us if, if we're living in friendship with him? Uh, 
Paul and uh, here it serves to bolster confidence in the final salvation of Christians. So we're justified by his blood at present, and we have been reconciled to God through the death of his son. These are two ways of saying that the crucifixion was an atoning sacrifice that reestablished believers in a covenant relationship with God. The first expression echoes Paul's remarks in chapter 3, while the second introduces a new element into the discussion, the concept of reconciliation. Reconciliation refers essentially to a mended relationship. It is what happens when enemies become friends, when family members, once estranged, are reunited. Here, Paul means the removal of animosity between God and sinful humanity. And so forgiveness is a crucial part of the picture. See 2 Corinthians 5.19. One would say that reconciliation encapsulates the whole notion of being justified and at peace with God. In view of the staggering depths, this is now page 79, in view of the staggering depths to which God has lowered himself for our redemption, Paul expresses great confidence that Christians will be saved in the end. Again, the perseverance and all the things that he mentioned, the, the endurance and everything that going through with this. Paul views the Christian life as a, a continuum of salvation with a beginning, a middle, and an end. The apostle just speaks of, this is St. Paul, just speaks, can thus speak of the past as a time when Christians were saved, 824, of the present as a time when Christians are being saved, 1 Corinthians 118, and the future as the time when Christians will be saved, Romans 5, 9 through 10, and 13, 11. So we are saved through him, through Christ. He underscores that Jesus is the mediator of God's efforts to reconcile the world to himself. By saying that believers will be saved from the wrath, he alludes to the final judgment, the, quote, day of wrath. Uh, chapter 2, verse 5, when the Lord, and, and uh, the varied prophets, when, when, in the Old Testament, when the Lord will reveal the full measure of his justice, to be saved from this is to be rescued from final condemnation. By saying that believers will be saved by his life, Paul specifies that salvation is a participation in the risen life of the Messiah. Paul rounds off his preface to Romans 5, Eight, with the reference to Christian boasting. He already stated that believers boast in their hope of the glory of God. Verse 2, at which point he added a reference to boasting of afflictions, exalting in afflictions. Now he attacks on a third object of Christian exaltation. We boast of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul does not mean that God's people should strut around bragging about the blessings they have received. This boast, boast is entirely directed to God, who has achieved our reconciliation with him in the Messiah. It is the Lord's work that calls for celebration. So let's end there. And <coughs> let's see who's... Watching here, Ella O'Sullivan, Wilfredo Hernandez, Pat Gunning, and Judy Hardigan, and Roger Reese out there. And let's pray the Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let's push the finish button. There it is.